Coming to you live from the Business Radio X studio in Woodstock, Georgia, this is Fearless Formula with Sharon Klein. And welcome to Fearless Formula on Business Radio X, where we talk about the ups and downs of the business world and offer words of wisdom for business success. And I'm your host, Sharon Klein. And today in the studio, we have the owner of Terminus Production Rentals, as well as Adult Films with a Z, LLC. And he is a picture car coordinator. He's worked with Marvel. He's got just the most interesting backstory, and I cannot wait to hear about it. Um, Please welcome to the studio, Joshua Fuller. Well, thank you. How are you? Good. Tired, but we're here. You were saying before the show, between you and the woman that you, your, your partner, you have like five children. And, yes. and some are in teens and some are still young. And I don't know how you do it. It's a madhouse some days. <laughs> yeah, probably just like everyone, right? Like business owner, dad. You've got several businesses that you manage. Yes. And then she has a business too. So it's always business, business. And then try to have fun and business. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully this will be a little like 40 minute respite of just enjoyment, right? That's what this conversation is all about. All right. So I wanted to ask you a couple things. One, you got into, you're an actor as well, which I forgot to mention. Yes. Um, so you've gotten, how did you get into the industry of acting? So it started with the picture car industry. Uh, awesome. I came in as a teamster, which is a driver. And then I moved to cars because it's kind of my forte and then since I was doing cars all the time, um, it was more profitable and made more sense to also get into the acting side because in stunts, because I have to drive the car sometimes. So it's kind of a double dip. <laughs> How did you get into the car industry that you were helping with movies? How did that start? Term- what did you call it? Teamster. The Teamsters. Teamsters. So that was a last minute thing. I was on a military leave. I came back from leave and I was working at United Rentals as a driver at the time. And the driver that we thought was going to be there till retirement was gone all of a sudden. I was like, something's not right here. He was supposed to stay here for another 10 to 20 years. So I call him up and I was like, what's going on? He's like, I left and went to the movie industry. I was like, what is this? And this is like eight years ago. He's like, this is the first time they opened up in they've opened up the union for Teamsters in like 10 years or something. I don't even remember what it was. And I was like, cool, what did I need to do? And he's like, you have to put your name on a list and pay like $1,500 and you may never work. <laughs> Good Lord. And I was like, mm, I hate my job. Let's do it. And so at the time, I didn't have the money because we had I'd owned a company before that that didn't go as well because of the industry, the price of fuel and so on and so forth. It was a trucking company. If anybody knows about trucking, they understand a hundred percent. So I was like, we were starting over from that. And so I found the title on my car at the time to pay to get into the industry. Wow. Such faith, man. <laughs> uh, sometimes the risk is worth it. And yeah. at that time it turned out amazing. I've never looked back since. So what was it like the first time you were on a set and, you know, driving a car and I don't know. I'm just trying to imagine myself walking in with absolutely no orientation of what it's like. So it's different for everybody. I've never had the whole fame like thing that some people have. Like, I don't really care. They're all people to me. So it was just another day. I was like, okay, cool. This is different. I got fed. They fed it. You feed you like three times a day. So I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> I get paid to come to work and eat. But other than that, I was like, all right, it's just different line of work. And make the best out of it. So have you ever seen yourself then on screen? Like you're the one driving in a particular scene? Most of the time when you're doing anything like that, your background or stunt or something like that. And so it's all in the background. You you can catch quick glimpses of yourself. There's a movie I was on, but I still can't say it because it hasn't came out yet. Oh. And this is like three years ago. So at this point, I don't think they're going to release it. But who cares at this point? It, it, it's what let me get my SAG card in the first place. So if someone were wanting to get into that industry, what would you recommend they do besides pawn their car? <laughs> so for, if you want in the, the movie industry period, you either join one of the unions. And if you want in the acting union, I just tell you good luck because it's a whole world of who knows. Everybody has a different story. Like it's never the same story twice for sure. 
Um, some people get lucky by doing the little background stuff here and there. Some people get, they just do the uh, classes and go to school for it. Some people just happen to be on a set or near a set and the producers like, they look perfect for this scene, pull them in right now. So there's literally no two same ways usually. Is there anything that surprised you about the industry um, that you think the average person doesn't know? It's 90% headache with like maybe 10% fun at the end. Oh my gosh, that's a really, really bad statistic. <laughs> that's, everybody asks me, like, how fun it is? Like even for the car, it's like it's 90% of background work or back work in the back pages, like budgets and running all the cars and make sure it's going to work, building stuff. And then they change the script hourly sometimes, daily, weekly. And so you'll prep for two or three weeks and then it'll change last second. And everything you've done for two weeks is just going in the garbage can. Like It doesn't even matter. We've, we've built stuff and spent thousands of dollars to not even use it. So it's crazy. It's probably one of the industries where there's the most wasted money ever. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> you get paid regardless, right? I don't work if I don't get paid. Nice. Okay. So, and then they say there's a little small place in hell for all the pitch car people like us because we'll take brand new cars and blow them up. That's just wild, isn't it? Does it like hurt a little bit? Slightly for car enthusiasts <laughs> like me. It is slightly aggravating because we try to get parts and they're like, nope, we're just going to crush them. So I'm looking at your Facebook page, Terminus Production Rentals, and I see that you've, um, I mean, you've got motorcycles you work with as well, and you've got classic cars and newer cars. So has there been a favorite vehicle that you've had that you've been able to ride and or or drive? I'm a classic car guy, so I like classic trucks mainly. So like old C10s and all are my favorite things. Just none of the new sensors and so on and so forth. The favorite, the craziest car I drove was a Pagani. Just the the build behind one of those is insane. Um, but besides that, I'd still have to say classic cars all day, every day, because I don't have to worry about the new stuff. I can take it in the backyard and work on it if I need to. That's so cool. So, okay, you got into the Teamsters side, and then you became an actor. And so, and now you have your, is that how you got your company? Um, you decided to kind of just make your own, like, LLC kind of company um, with Terminus Production Rentals? Yeah, that's, so that's what, that's, that kind of fell into that because we wanted to just capitalize on it. And I was making all these connections with all these people for networking their cars and hitting all the car events anyway. So it just made more sense to start capitalizing on that. Heck and yeah. then we've added private jets now to the collection. If <laughs> anybody wants to rent those to cars that we just flip and blow up and just use for stunt purposes, just for the fun of it. And then anything in between cars, bikes, trucks, planes, we build spaceships. If you want it pretty much in between, we can have it done. That's amazing because this is such a great town for it. I mean, I'm, I imagine you there's no shortage of work. It's definitely increased in the last few years until, I mean, movies go, have their ups and downs, the strikes that just happened didn't just help ask you, yeah. for any of that. Like we had equipment sitting around for like seven months with nothing to do. The so worst feeling. There's nothing you do on that one except for, I mean, just wait for it to pick back up. I mean, we had a couple of music videos. We just sourced a car for... I want to say it was a lot of music video. I'm yeah. not even sure. I talk to producers more than I do the people that work on the shows. So they called me and was like, hey, we need a car tomorrow. And I was like, got you. What is it? And we found it within the day. Wow. They had it delivered. Um, really good at last minute things. It's not fun, but that's why I was talking about the headaches come from. Yeah, but if people know they can count on you, then that's like, um, I don't know, what do they call it? A unique selling point of you, you yeah. know, something that you could stand out. Well, that and then our, in our industry, we say chaos equals cash because the last minute stuff equals more money. Holy cow. <laughs> that and you've got also your adult films, tints, wraps, and coding. So um, can you tell me about the name? Have you had any flack? We get tons of <laughs> good and bad. I say as long as the hamster starts spinning, I don't really care. I get questions about it regardless. Good or bad, it's good questions when it comes to marketing. Um, the name actually came from, we were had another name. It started out as Astronaut Window Works. And then we started expanding to other things. And so I wanted to rename it as a more memorable name because people couldn't remember it. 
So I was like, what can we do? What can we do? <laughs> Being in the movie industry for as long as I have been, when people would find out I was in the movie industry, the first question, I don't know if it was just a joke to everybody <laughs> or icebreaker or whatever you may want to call it. Oh, no. They, but they would ask me, do you do adult films? So I'm like, eventually when I was thinking about redoing the name, I was like, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And one day I was sitting there just riding in my truck and I was like, ping, light bulb. I was like, I'm going to call my company Adult Films. And I called my partner and she was like, no, you're not. And I was like, <laughs> it's already done. I was like, I've already literally hit the button to change the name and started the process. She was like, okay, fair enough. It, but why? And I told her, I was like, she's like, well, I guess it is a good play on words and it works because everything we use is some type of film for the most part. So for like signage, obviously, but it works and then it gets people's attention. I can't believe adult films with a Z wasn't taken as a, you know, as, as a name. That was my next, like soon as I thought of it, I looked it up on all the business pages and I couldn't find it anywhere. I was like, that domain name is to, yours. <laughs> I was like, it was meant to be, I was like, whether, how this goes from here, I don't even care. Is like the fact that it's not taken at this day and age, I'm taking it. <laughs> so this is your premier. I'm also looking on your Facebook page for this one. Your premier provider of professional tints, coatings, wraps, wall coverings, and vinyls. So how did you get into that? Did you find that because you already were sort of part of the movie industry, they were asking you to be able to do these kinds of things, wraps and things like that? Well, we were already doing that. So like oh. when they would need something last minute on cars that we already had. Sometimes we'd have to knock out windows. We wouldn't want the glass to bust on the actors' faces and so on and so forth. So we would do, like, the security films and stuff like that on that last minute. And then we've wrapped hundreds of police cars with police finals and put the police lights on them and stuff like that. So it was something that we were already doing, but I didn't have my own company for it. So then I was like, well, why not take something outside of the movie industry since it's so fragile of an industry? And they take and it's shuts down and we're here in Georgia. So it's all based on tax incentive. If they were to take the tax incentive away today, the movies would leave today, not tomorrow. They would leave today, maybe be like 10% of film left in Georgia after that. But for 90% would leave today. They would literally pack it up. Same thing that happened in New Orleans, same thing that happened to Florida. I mean, tax incentive for movies counts for millions of dollars saved. So seeing that Georgia has such an amazing tax incentive, they will continue to film here until they take it away. So when they talk about that for law and for everything else and for the new governors coming in, if they were to take that away, you're talking about taking away 10 to $12 billion a year, give or take, right now. I always think Georgia is so unique in that it's got – almost all the different kinds of landscapes that you can imagine. You've got beach and you've got mountains and you've got, if you go South Georgia, it looks like Florida, you know, um, I, I can't even think of all the other, you got like trees, you know, forests. I'm just thinking how this is kind of a great spot, this whole state. So the state is great for filming because it does have a lot of different locations. You have the beach and Savannah and stuff. I mean, we filmed everything from Baywatch there to anything you can think of, like some of the old railroad movies, cause it has the old town look to some of the cities here do are still like straight old school and have the old brick and stuff for the downtown areas. You do have any of the wood scenes. You have lakes here. You have pretty much any like Ozarks. I was part of Ozark season two and three. I mean, it's filmed right here in this area. Yeah. I, um, yep. It's right, right around the corner um, from here. My son's school. The Blue Cat Lodge, which mm -hmm. is JD's barbecue now. Um, I was there for two years, pretty much um, at the end of season three, they sold off the land to JD's, I think, or somebody else at the time. But it has a very unique thing. But at the same time, they're looking at dollar signs. They'll film anywhere to save millions of dollars. I mean, any with it, along with any other business, if I can save a million dollars at the end of my yearly budget, I'm going to probably. So. Of course. I think cash is king. It is it it is the driver. That's why I have people on the show talking about their businesses. Because what is it like to have your own company and know that you really need to spend time with your wife because it's your anniversary and you've got to put your phone down? And how do you balance you know, being a small business owner and knowing that you've got to compete with other companies. And um, I have found a lot of people say that having just the right people around you helps so much, um, having people supporting what you're doing so that you're not sort of always fighting. But um, what is that like for you if you've, you know, trying to balance work? <laughs> I was thinking the movie industry, don't they film at night a lot? Like, I mean, 
they film day, night, 15, 18 hours, days, it doesn't matter. Um, so that was, that's been crazy, obviously. And now that I've kind of moved up, it gives me a little bit more free time within industry because I have to, I budget everything and find stuff, but I, I don't always have to be there. So it saves me a lot of the time with the family. But like we said, we ha- I have five kids together. And so balancing sports, my companies and all that, it definitely creates a major headache by having people that refer you, having friends that help out, having family members and friends there, regardless, they can help take you to practices or kids to practices and so on and so forth. And then setting those boundaries of like, like anybody that knows me knows I'll answer my phone at 2 a.m. If you have a broke down car, I'll come pick you up in the middle of the night. And I keep my phone on 24 seven, but I don't answer phone calls for work after a certain time. Like I'll look at it and I'll leave it there. But the phone's always on for people that need help. Like don't call me at 8 p.m. for a work related thing unless it's for something like the movies and the sets are still filming. Obviously, we have to answer. But if it's for something other than that, one of my other businesses, I'm going to tell you I'll get back to you in the morning. And then, but if you call me in the middle of the night and it's like, hey, I'm in jail. I'm broke down. <laughs> we're going to come take care of you. Good to know. I'm going to keep you on speed dial for those moments when that happens to Fair me. Fair enough. <laughs> But no, that's smart. Everyone talks about the challenge of trying to balance your life. I mean, it wasn't always like that. But now, um, even with social media, people who are um, having reviews in the middle of the night, there always is an opportunity for you to be looking at how your business is being affected on the internet and through social media, what that's like. And most people have to just like really shut their phones down and, you know, give themselves that peace of mind. And I, I mean, I can understand, especially in your case, knowing that what you could do could be 24 seven, if you really wanted it to be, you know, it requires discipline. I feel like any business, if you let it will consume you, whether it's, if you're working for somebody else, if you let it consume you, cause a boss that finds somebody that works very well, it's going to push them to work more because it's more profitable that way. But that's where it comes in to set the boundaries and so on and so forth to make sure that you have that work life balance because I hate to say, I don't know if you've traveled a lot to other countries, but America alone is a fast paced country. It never slows down. It never sleeps. Pretty much you go to work, you come home, you go to work, come home. And it's not like some of the other countries where it's family first. And then that as much as I love America, we are a fast paced and everybody wants more, more cars, better cars, faster cars or better house or bigger. And so many people even grow up poor, they want more in life and they want to spend more money to make more money and so on and so forth, but they forget the balance. And that's what gets people way off sometimes. And they, if you realize that the balance is right, then you can be more profitable than anyways. Because a lot of people, they offer discounts to try to make more money, but then they're not, they're cutting their self-worth right off the bat. So, but then you have a lot of companies, medical field. It's a lot of greed because we're a for-profit country, regardless of what people don't think. It's for-profit all the time. Did you want to be in this industry when you were younger? Is this what you sort of thought your life would, would be like? <laughs> you're, I, you're chuckling over there. <laughs> I actually found a letter that I wrote. I don't even know how old I was. I want to think I was like six or seven, and it was probably one of the like preschool or kindergarten things that we wrote. Um, it was a couple years ago I found it. And it said that when I grew up, I wanted to work at Walmart so I could have <laughs> all the toys to play with. And maybe think like, okay, what do we really want in our life? Like growing up as kids, you don't think about all the crazy things. Like, yeah, we wanted some of the four wheelers or dirt bikes or such. But at the time, you're like, I just want all the new toys that come out so I can, <laughs> so I can sample them. <laughs> so your dream was to work at Walmart. It's very at, different what you're doing At right like now. six, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, as it grew up, I thought for a while there, I mean, I joined the military and stuff that we were thinking, of, I, I guess I was looking at the public service stuff and everything else. But to be honest, support to all the public service people that are still out there because I wouldn't do it to save my life anymore because there's so many political things that go into mm-hmm. it. So many people that don't like anybody that comes to help you nowadays. Firefighters are probably always respected, but your police officers and some of your military, they're not even respected anymore. Well, thank you for your service. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I was thinking I had just read something recently about how first responders that come, with, you know, an ambulance, how abused they get from pe- trying to help people. You know, it'll be like, don't touch me, things like that. But they're there to help you, you know. So I can't imagine the constitution you have to have to deal with it. Yeah, I realized 
after being in the Marine Corps and stuff, that wasn't something I want to do anymore. And then if you're wanting to live, it doesn't really pay for it anymore either. Interesting. There's a whole side I don't know much about because I haven't been in the military. So I imagine, you know, you have a whole story back there that you could talk about. Well, that firefighters, the police officers, I mean, if you look at the cost of living, especially today over the what's happened in the last two or three years since COVID, the cost of living has raised like 300%. Those salaries don't support that. Mm-mm. If they're not working afternoon jobs or those roadside jobs or whatever, most of them can't support a family. How did COVID affect your industry? I sat at home for like seven months. Did you panic? COVID affected so many people in this town, and I was wondering, you know, what it was like on your end because, I mean, they're essential workers, obviously, but like plumbers and restaurant owners, and everyone has their story about how the movie industry shut down completely. And then once we started back up, I mean, the COVID protocols were insane. I mean, I probably had easily 500 COVID tests. I mean, they would literally, when we first went back to work, I think it was October of 2020 when I went back to work for the first time, it was on a Marvel show. Um, We got COVID tested five days a week, every day. And they weren't nice with it at first. Like my nose bled every time they would shove it up to your brain almost and just try to COVID test you. So, and then it went from five days a week to like six months in, you were still like three days a week. And then after that, you're like two days a week. And then all the way up till probably the end of 2022, we were still getting tested at least once a week. So did anyone have a test as a surprise positive? Because there were so many people that were uh, asymptomatic. So along the time, seeing that I've had like 500 tests, I tested positive four times. Never once did I feel sick, but they sent me home regardless and told me to stay at home for two weeks. I was like, okay, there's like twice where once was like before a show, so you don't get paid then because they don't hire you. Once was at the end of the show, it was like literally the, the day I was quitting, so you don't get paid then. Well, not quitting. It was just the, literally the end of the show. It was like the last week, but we were still getting tested. And uh, and twice was in the middle of the show, and I got paid for like the time off. So those weren't bad at all. You're like, okay, cool. I feel good. Let's just go home and take two weeks of pay. <laughs> but the in-between was definitely sometimes. And then the the nuisance of just being tested every single day, you had to show up for the test regardless, or else you weren't allowed to work the next day. It became a nuisance after a while. I think that felt the same for so many people. But it was. I remember the first time I went out without a mask, I think I went to like Target. <laughs> like a mini panic attack. A lot of people were still masking up no matter what, right? But like for me, I kind of liked being able to wear a mask because, you know, I just didn't care how I looked. Nobody cared. No one saw anything. I saved so much lip gloss. You don't understand. But then walking through, you know, and being like without <laughs> without anything, I was like, I got to wear sunscreen again. It just was an odd thing how much I accepted and adapted oh, to all of it. Time. Yeah, I just was like... The mask were the worst thing ever for me. I hate putting something over my face. It if it, if it slows down my breathing any, I'm like, oh, this, to panic. I just hate it. I feel hot. I'm a hot natured person, so like a mask just makes me my whole face would instantly start sweating when I put it on. Um, and then during the movie sets, they wanted you to wear them all day. I literally hated life at first having to wear a mask. I'm like, and then seeing that we started back in like the cold season, like October, November. The allergies or the colds, people would look at you like you're insane for showing up to work. I'm like, I just got a cold. Come on, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, it's not real. I was like, we get tested five days a week. I think I would know if I had COVID at the moment. And I'm like, I just have a cold right now, runny nose or whatever. And people just look at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, this is crazy. It seems strange now when I think about it because it's been, what, a year or so maybe or nothing, more? Yeah. That nothing. So when I think about, like, I still have my mask in my car. <laughs> but, you know, like I said, I adapted. I drank the Kool-Aid. This is what we have to do to go out sometimes. So, um, But now when I think about it, it seems kind of strange to, you know, I don't know, to worry about that kind of thing. I do... I do notice if I'm in an office, if people are coughing, I kind of am like, I wonder if that's anything more serious than just a cold. I don't know. My brain now is kind of on high alert. But um, yeah, at some point we'll look back and be like, oh, that whole thing, the pandemic. But no, it's, it's like, it's so nice to be able to move forward and not have to think about it at all, especially for your industry. I imagine, I know the writer's strike was horrible. It affected so many different um, industries, not just film, but TV as well. It was 
none, no one really could imagine when it was going to end, but so nice when it did end. So it must have felt like things were running again for you as well. Well, yeah, it was weird because most people think it's just the writer strikes. The writer went on, the writers went on strike last year in like May. And then at the same time, the actors went on strike in June. And so the writers got done with their strike October ish, mm -hmm. November, but the actors were still on strike until almost December. And then everybody like, still thinks that we're all back full swing. We're still not even full swing really? yet because the holidays happened right after that. So nobody wants to pay production as a start, pay all these people to sit around. So then when you come back, you think you've got to wait for all the producers to come in town, the writers to start writing scripts and all that stuff. So we still have, we're at maybe 20 to 30% back full. Really? We're not, we're, we, they're saying March to April we'll be back in full swing. Right wow. now we're still, all the offices are, prepping and back prepped and stuff like that. So we'll still be kind of low until March to April, and then we should be back full swing. But then you also have the possibility of the IOTC and the Teamsters Union striking this year because our contracts come up. And since everything that happened last year, they're expecting the support from the unions we supported last year. So mm -hmm. if we don't get what we want, then – not necessarily us, but you got between IOTC and Teamsters, then they're already planning on striking. So you're, you're talking about it could be another strike this year. I was just thinking how your busy season's about to come up. You know, if March and April is when it's going to be back in full swing, then you'll be like, okay, well, I'll see you guys whenever. But I want to say our contracts come up in June or July. So technically, I think they have so much time to prep for them and they can do a little bit of delay. So if we start back full swing in March, April, you could go back and on strike in August, September, or if they know that shows won't even start yet. That's, I think that's kind of why we're slow this year is because we figured that we would go back full swing already, but with everything looming over the air, people might not want to pay the money to start because then if you rent a stage, you're renting stage, you're renting all the equipment, you're renting all the, the stuff and you got to hold it mm -hmm. like over strike. I know, one of the Marvel shows that was filming at the time, um, not the strike, but over like COVID, they they held a location for like six months at like fifteen thousand dollars a week to hold the location because it was halfway through a filming. But what can you do when they shut every, the world down at the time? So it it was definitely crazy. But when you're as busy as we stay, usually as long as you've kind of put a little bit cash away, which we all say in this industry, it you put cash away because it can go up or down at the, any second. You enjoy your time off. You try to take the time with the family because I tell anybody that's wanting to get into the movie or film industry, period, it will consume your entire life if you let it because they'll work you 17, 18 hours a day, five to six, seven days a week, and it'll just go on as long as you let it. You'll go run off one show straight to the next show because it's referral-based. So as long as you're good at your job, you will stay working. Um, some people never work, and then you get some people that never stop. So if you're good and if you network, um, networking across every industry every one of my businesses the movie industry the film industry whatever networking is key um if you want to succeed a lot of times they used to say it's not what you know it's who you know but at the same time it is still what you know and what you can provide because if you suck at your job they're going to re refer that you suck at your job and they're not going to hire you in the voiceover industry um not everybody is it easy to work with. <laughs> um, and I didn't realize how valuable it is to be considered an easy to work with person because I, I would so much rather work with someone who maybe doesn't have the exact sound that I love so much, but I, it, they're easy to work with. They show up on time. They deliver their files when they're supposed to their audio files. It's super valuable. So I imagine it's the same in your industry. Like if you're a, a, an asshole, you know, I can't imagine I mean, well, maybe yeah. it does work. I really don't know. How does it work like that for you? I mean, it depends across everything. I mean, first off, we want somebody who's going to show up on time and be there at work every day because we all know these days it is hard to find some good people that will show up every day regardless of what's going on. Um, people to find every excuse, especially since COVID, it's completely through the work ethic. Crazy. Really interesting. Um, but, I mean, if somebody shows up to work every day, obviously, if they can work good with you, it's going to make it 10 times better. Um, and that's what kind of helped me excel across my industries is no matter what industry I was in, everywhere I've been and every person I've ever met was like, no matter how bad the day is, you bring a delight to the day. You make it better. You're happy. 
you try to have a good joke or just make somebody laugh throughout the day. No matter if it's the most stressful day we've ever had, you're like, you show up and you're just happy. And I'm like, I try to be because there's nothing I can do to change most of the circumstances we're in, but make the best of it. I was thinking, I imagine, obviously, if there are actors that are, you know, they're worth hiring because they have power this way, but like they're not really nice to work with. I mean, people are going to just deal with that. But if you're replaceable, I imagine they would choose to have somebody who's, you know, more positive. Well, with that being said, I've worked with a lot of major movie stars across the board. And uh, there are some that you don't want to talk to every day, but because of their status, they're there. And there's nothing you can do about it. But keep on moving and wait till the next that show ends. Good thing about the movie industry is usually it's anywhere from a month to six months to a year at the most, usually, and you're on to the next project. So if you can make it through one, you just kind of go one day at a time. You're like, all right, this this sucks, but mm-hmm. it's going to get better. And the next one will be different, and you kind of pick and choose who you want to work with every now and again once you make it to a certain level. What do you think of the fact that TV has changed so much? So that's what's caused a lot of our strikes because we went from – Everything being feature movies and all, we all knew that the strikes were eventually going to come because you went from the mainstream feature movies and all being in movie theaters for profits and the points on the back end to where everything went streaming. And so when it first came out, nobody knew how big the streaming was going to turn. And we all knew that we saw it coming, but we didn't know where it was going to go. And so every one of the strikes that's pretty much happened has been because of the contracts were meant for feature movies and they weren't meant for streaming because there was never a such thing as streaming. And so now it's changed a lot. Um, The way everything films, the way it works, the points, the pays, everything has changed. And that's why the, the, the strikes are so needed because the pays were so off between the industries, between the way they were filmed and the way they were released so on and so forth. Just for instance, um, just say for like Marvel, like some of the Marvel movies that were getting released on Disney Plus, some of the actors had took in points so they would get paid on all the, the movie features when it got released in theaters. Well, there's a few of those that never released in theaters and went straight to streaming. So those actors lost out all of their money because they took like 90% points or something like that. I don't know the exact numbers, but they took mostly points for pay because if you're going to do a big, huge Marvel movie, the you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars across theaters. And then all of a sudden they release it on streaming and now you got nothing. So that's the main reason all the strikes have happened Makes to, sense. To, to make and try to justify and fix all this stuff. And now you have AI, which is another reason. So like on top of us still haven't caught up to the streamings field. Now we're dealing with the AI field. So you have double reasons for everybody to try to negotiate their pays and everything. Because, I mean, technically, you could film a whole movie through AI. You don't even need everything. It could be visually effect now, especially if you have a certain actor and you have their their digital files and you do a scan because we can scan anything in now and recreate it in the visual effects department. So it's according to how much you want to spend. It costs way more to usually do visual effects, but you could type it into AI. And it, if you have all the background and the information, it can make a movie. That's so crazy when you think about it. So, yeah, it's changing the whole industry, and everybody is just kind of sitting back waiting to see where that goes. It's crazy to imagine that I could be watching something where I think it's you speaking, you, Josh. Yeah. And it's not really you, but it looks like you, and it sounds like you, and and it's so realistic. I'm wondering how difficult it would be for me. I'm sure every day it gets more advanced. You know, so I imagine it must be at some point will be so difficult to discern what's actually a real interview. Yeah, I or mean, between video. that, I mean, for cars, for locations, if you scan in the location once or if you have a car driving down the road, we can take a car that looks like a little rail car, for instance, and put a little BD. It looks like a camera type thing that spins around on top of it. But as it's spinning, it's registering what we're wanting it to register to the, the, the camera. So. We're seeing a little rail car, the camera's seeing a brand new Lamborghini or whatever they want. So it's insane what they can do with all the the effects now. Do you think classic movie making will go away at some point? I know everything comes down to dollars. So if at some point it's more feasible (laughs) to hire a company as opposed to actors and all of the logistics and, you know, just how clunky people are, (laughs) you know? (laughs) 
I have no idea I'm because curious. I think there's always going to be people that want to see the real life versions of people acting and the art form in it and so on and so forth. But at this point, I don't put anything past anything. Like anything could happen tomorrow and it's, so it's just part of it. And you just go with it. Who would have ever thought two years ago that AI would be such a prominent feature on so many different aspects of our lives. I had a woman who, who um, is an expert on AI um, on the show and she said um, she pretty much every day refers to chat GPT for different problems that she has. And at one point, um, AI, the, the website was down for a little while and she was like, well, I'll just solve this, you know, when it comes back up. Like she had actually gave her anxiety because she didn't have access to it. And, and it's just part of some people's every day. And I imagine I could be using it more than I do. But yeah, I hate computers so if you talk to my partner, she would tell you every day, if you see me have to get on a computer for more than like 20 minutes, I'm going to get mad and have to walk <laughs> away. I, I prefer to do everything in person, talk, still make phone calls. I don't, I don't even like testing truly that much. If I can talk to somebody in person, I feel so much better. Um, you and your classic carness too, you know, yeah, it's the old I, school. I, I, the old school <laughs> stuff, I, I'll stick with it probably until I die. Um, and as much as it's changing and stuff, for some of the things that I have to do for my businesses, I let people do it for me because I'd still rather pay somebody to do it for me than have the computer do it all for me. And I know I can call and say, hey, what's going on on the computer? I, like, I can't really ask the computer, hey, what's going on with the computer? I mean, I guess you could, but I don't think it's going to tell me the same thing if I go talk to somebody in person. So yeah. it's just not my my forte and I don't care for it so much, but I do have to understand that there is things like the automated emails and stuff like that, which I try not to automate email people because I, I, I get so much spam email a I day know, and too. everything. So I don't want to add to everybody else's spam collection. Like <laughs> hopefully our work does justice for itself. People see it populating here and there because we do post pictures and so on and so forth. But I try not to spam people. I, I care. I, That's I, nice. You have you have compassion. I mean, you'd be just one of millions, you know, mixed in there. So it's the, the fight is real. <laughs> It is. I mean, and I mean, I guess it does create more cells and more, I guess they call it the sales funnels and so on and so forth. But I'm hoping my, between my word of mouth and the websites we have and so on and so forth, it keeps generating our networking and community outreach that we've done. Mm-hmm. It's worked thus far. So I don't foresee it going anywhere. And obviously you're still always going to have the paid ads and so on and so forth. But I prefer not to have to do everything automated by AI. I mean, because everything now, even people's artwork, we ha- I've seen machines now that you literally punch in a graphic and it goes up to the side of a building and spray paints it like somebody just spray painted the side of your building now. Like the art's changing, everything. So it's kind of up to society to keep the real art alive at this point because you can make music, you can make songs, you can make paintings, you can make you can anything books. with the computer mm-hmm. or robot now. Mm-hmm. It makes me wonder, and I asked this to the woman that I had on, um, who's an expert on AI, where is the value of a human brain then? You know, where, how valuable is a human brain if you can hi, ask ChatGPT to write the copy for this, I don't know, this thing that you're selling, and then it writes it, and then you just put it out there. It just makes me wonder. I mean, I guess if we could keep the cost of living to where we could all just enjoy ourselves, then we would just all have a permanent vacation. But because chat GPT or whatever's going to run our life, AI is going to do it all for us and we can just enjoy. <laughs> I, I just see that somebody making all the money on that and all the rest of sitting around poor and being like, hey, can we have something? Can I have bread today or something? But until then, I don't I don't know how that's going to turn out. So we just kind of keep going with it every day. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to see how that happens too in another 50, 60 years. Cause Interesting. I mean, I, I solely work to enjoy my free time and I try to keep my, my balance and they, and together and like, we enjoy traveling and enjoy having some fresh food and stuff. Like that's part of going to all these other countries is you get straight fresh food off the trees and anything so you can think different. of. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's different. It's a slower pace. You go relax for a few weeks and come back. It's definitely the resets you need sometime. Mm-hmm. Do you ever watch movie? Is movie watching or TV watching just kind of ruined for you? <laughs> Do you ever get the impact of a movie the way it was supposed to be, uh, you know, hitting uh, uh, someone who's not in the industry? So I try not to pick them apart. Um, I got some friends that will literally sit there and just pick them apart all day long. My partner said at first, sometimes if we we're watching something, I'd pick it apart. 
But I try to actually just sit back and enjoy stuff if I'm watching TV, period. I don't really watch TVs at, at all, especially episodic. I don't have time. Mm. Um, I will sit down and watch a movie with my kids, if, especially if it's like a cartoon movie. And to be honest, these days I almost enjoy the cartoon movies more <laughs> than I do anything else because it's got nothing to do with a lot of things in the world. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't have time to watch anything for long periods of time. So I'll sit down with the kids, maybe watch one movie, and then be over with and kind of go back to whatever I'm doing for the day. Do you feel like you have a, a fearless formula, so to speak? Like, is there something that allows you to be so brave to just go out there and do what you do, start these companies and um, m- kind of mix into a, a world that people think of as so glamorous and I know glamour is not the right word, but so powerful and um, important, but you obviously have maintained such a humbleness about you and you don't buy into any of that. How do you not get, I don't know. Um, so, how do you keep yourself grounded? I mean, we. I actually grew up super poor. Um, and then being in the military, like, I stuck in the reserves in the National Guard and stuff even longer after that because I would have to go back and be humble for the weekend. I would go work for somebody else or so on and so forth just to keep myself super humble sometimes. But then at this point, I've realized in my life, 90% of the things that people consider luxury items – to me, I consider them a tool. They're a networking tool. They're a tool so I don't have to spend as much effort. So like say with some of our high-end cars, I'll use a high-end car to go to an event. And the only reason I'm doing it, some people are like, oh, you're showing off. I'm like, no, it's not a show off. I can show up one of the cars. I don't even have to get out of the car and people come to me because people, most people in the world are are wired to think that if you have this certain thing, then you have money or you've made it somewhere. Um, and they don't give people the chance of the day without that. Mm-hmm. So now I realize that 90% of that's tools and that some of the most humble and the best people you'll meet are some of the poorest people you, you can find. And then if you go to some of these other countries and stuff where there isn't the money there is here or there isn't the opportunities there are here, you'll find these people, you, they have a community Whereas, like, when you think about the way we are here, everybody's so judgmental and there's no community. So, I, I mean, networking here in America is, like, kind of the thing, the only thing that keeps you kind of, like, the humbleness and the community vibe. Because you don't get those vibes from, oh, I'm the biggest, baddest entrepreneur out there. Like, those people most of the time aren't fun to be around. Like, some of these stars that make millions and millions a year, they're not fun to be around. They think they're better than everybody else. And I hate to say it every day. We all get dressed the same way. <laughs> and, I mean, even for the handicapped people or the people like that, like we still all get dressed the same way and we help each other out. And for them, like we help them out more. Like there's no sense of treating them different than anybody else. Like we have people, I have friends that have died for military. I have friends that are triple and quadruple MTs and stuff. It doesn't matter at this point. Like we're all still humble and try to show each other that every day I can help you as much as you can help me. And I will give you anything I can, if I can give it to you, as long as you're a humble person, you have a little bit of drive because these days, the hardest thing you can find is drive and motivation. Wow. That's so interesting to me. Um, especially in your industry. I mean, I was thinking how mu- how difficult it must be to feel like I'm going to make it, you know, and you just, if you don't have a constant thought process behind it of fighting and fighting and fighting to be seen or to audition that you, you won't make it. Oh, you won't. If you think about it, um, and I'll say this and it's kind of rude of me and however you want to put it, the 90% of the people I meet on sets that are background or extras, they act like they, they're the best ever. I'm like, you're a background or extra right now. You haven't even made it. And you're telling me all these things that you've done and you're going to do. Most of them don't even realize who you are at first. They just come up and talk to you and they ask you things. And most of the time I don't even give them, I mean, I'll talk to them, but I don't tell them exactly what we do. And I just kind of want to see what they're about. Um, but they don't even understand that like the amount of effort it takes to get to be one of the major people. If you look on the movies and stuff today, the major ones that you see that have made money substantially are in every single movie and TV show out there. It, it's the same main 50 people, give or take. Like, it doesn't change. Like, those people have made it, and the rest, like, I have some friends that are actors, and they've probably been in 200 projects, and I could tell you their name, and you wouldn't even know their name because the average actor is starving. It's just the way it is. Um, And they are doing auditions daily 
four or five auditions daily, always traveling for work, always doing this, and still haven't made it to that top tier yet where they don't have to worry about work the next week or the next month or whatever. So as far as that, it is a very hard industry to break into. And I'm not saying you won't make it, but if you don't push harder than most people do, you're not going to make it unless you're just lucky. I mean, there are some few people I've met that showed up to set one day and bam, they're there. But it's just, I won't want to say that's luck, but we all have a destiny at some point in time. If you believe in destinies and stuff, there's certain things. And obviously if you pass up chances, you pass up a chance, but there's always a chance and opportunity in front of you and not everybody's meant to do the same thing, but we all have opportunity. And most people just, they say, if you don't, if you're not all on the lookout for opportunity, it'll pass by you all day, every day. And I think that's what most people do. They think, especially nowadays, people think that they're entitled to an opportunity or to money or to whatever. And they expect it just to come. Yeah. They're just waiting. Just it's, waiting. It's not going to come. And then even if it does, most of those opportunities aren't easy. You have to stick with them and you have to push and you have to go through the failures and you have to go through the learning and the critique and sometimes the critique, most people can't handle that mm-hmm. because, uh, we're all snowflakes and special. <laughs> but I think about how you took an opportunity. That's how this happened for you is you found out somebody was going to go do that. And then you said, how do you do that? You know, and the next thing you know, you're here at the Business Radio X studio. Well, if the you, biggest thing that's ever happened to you so far. <laughs> if you push that even further back, even to get to that opportunity, like I said, I owned a trucking company that didn't succeed like it should have. So I went from a trucking industry where we were making a couple hundred thousand a year to going almost bankrupt and starting over and getting rid of all the equipment we have just to go work for another company and just trying to get back on our feet and then getting there. And you're like, okay, cool. You go from one risk and you're like, all right, the thing is I've talked to a few people that are millionaires. You have a few people that are given money and they can invest and they're taught how to invest and so on and so forth. And then you have the people that are going to take a steady job that winds up doing very well or a career path that turns into a CEO and does very well or you have the people like us that have been poor and we're not scared to be poor. We know that we can still survive being poor. So if we take a risk and we lose it all, what's the worst we're going to do is go back to where we were and then start over again. And so that's how many times, how many many times can you get beat up and get back up again? And that's what it kind of boils down to sometimes. Yeah. You got to have a little bit of resilience to get knocked out. Maybe take a year, maybe take a month and maybe take, six years or maybe take the next day and be like, all right, I got knocked out today. Am I going to go back to training and figuring this all out? Or am I just going to lay here in defeat? And so that's what it kind of boils down to. I mean, it, as far as that industry, business, anything that you're into fighting in general. I mean, we've bought this stuff before. I mean, anything you, you can either lay there and take it or you can get up and fight back. And that's what it boils down to in the end. That sounds like that's your fearless formula. <laughs> It does. I think this is wise for any industry that anyone is in is you're going to have these setbacks, right? You're going to struggle. And um, just knowing that's one of my biggest lessons for my kids is, is resilience is we can do all the things that are right and then it can still go wrong. (laughs) And when I was, with that being said, when I was a kid, there was growing up poor, I used to look at some of these other kids and be like, why do they get to go on trips? Why do they get to do this? Why do they get to have all this? Why were they growing up with a silver spoon? And I look at some of them now, and because they grew up with that, they don't know what to do. They're lost because they they don't have the parents anymore, or they're lost because everything was given to them, and now they have to go out and work for it. And so as much as I say for even the kids, if the kids listen to this show, there is a part of growing up with that type of environment that just makes you resilient and then you can grow more as you're older and then if you can pass that down to your generations of children and stuff it it turns out very well i had someone on the show last week presley gray he's uh owns a a shop in dawsonville a mechanic shop and he said part of the reason he got into the industry is because he was they they were poor they had to figure out how to fix their cars on their own Mm -hmm. um and there's just something so organic and like pure about that (laughs) like yeah you fought you fought for yourself and now you've got these skills and you can take them you know, if you want, um, and use them to, to build your life off of. So I think there's something that's like, um, if it feels like you're fighting for yourself and there's just something that I can get behind and I almost feel as opposed to someone who's just given things. So knowing that you had that same feeling, um, 
I mean, it's exciting to see where you're going to go. You've got the heart, you've got the spirit, you know what it's like to not have those things. And, and then you're trying to manage your life (laughs) with all the kids and then the businesses. So, um, I feel like, I don't know, you're just fighting the good fight. Oh yeah. It's every day a fight, but we enjoy as much as we can. I mean, that's the whole point is if you're fighting, you got to enjoy what parts you can and go on about the next day and just look for the, look for the best part of every day. And then also, um, we, so part of my military career, when I have knee surgeries, they done a sequester and it's a crazy thing, but it gave me a completely outlook, different outlook on life. We were doing autopsies, um, for part of the military and after you see so much of that, you understand you are not guaranteed to tomorrow. So, I mean, for everybody, it's different. But when you understand you're not guaranteed the next second and you're not guaranteed tomorrow, it makes it a lot easier to enjoy what you do have. And, I mean, even for my kids now, they they, they sometimes cause complain about what they have or don't have. And I'm like, you literally aren't guaranteed what you have for one. And you're not even guaranteed the next day or the next minute. I was like, so you might as well make the best of whatever you have because it's what you have. You can't change what you have and what you don't have. So the only thing you can do is make the best out of every single situation. I mean, for us, I mean, part of us working so hard is so that in the next 10 years, we can partially retire or slow down so we can go live on like a tropical island where it is a slower pace. But for now, we have to keep up with all sports and stuff like that, which is fun for the kids and fun for us to watch and watch them grow and learn and enjoy things. But the fast pace, what do you, you also have to ask yourself, what are you doing the fast pace for? Because if you have no reason at the end of the day, why would you stay resilient anyways? Like, what are you really fighting for? Like for some people living a a slower, less paced life and you don't need all that stuff. There's no sense in having it. Like why waste all your money on stuff you don't need? So you have to evaluate yourself and see what you really want. What's your why? Yeah. Some people don't even know what their why is. People just go from day to day living and they don't even, if you ask them, why are they doing that? They, they wouldn't be able to tell you what I did yesterday. (laughs) Society. They've fell into the society of everybody else. Oh, what are we going to do? Uh, well, they're doing this. Well, why are you doing that though? And that's another thing. Like I know what I'm doing, what I'm doing. I want to retire early and I want to enjoy life and I want to travel and that's how we're going to fund it is the businesses running themselves eventually and all. And some people don't understand how to take their hands back from their business and put people in place to run the businesses. So that's another thing. Like if you're going to create a business or entrepreneurship, do you want to be there every day running it? Do you want to sit back? Do you want to build it up so you can sell it off? How do you want to do it? And why are you doing it? Such good questions. I think for anyone who's listening in um, considering any different kind of industry, why, why do you do what you do? And I, I love that you already know. And I'm I'm excited to see where you go. This is really fun for me because now I'll be looking for you in like the back of trucks or driving or whatever. I'll be like, I recognize that beard. <laughs> well, hopefully you won't see me too much. Oh. I, I enjoy being in the background of that and running the production from the background and running my businesses from the background. And we have a lot of amazing people that do stuff for us and amazing people we build things for. And it gives me more time to spend with my family. Uh, some people want to be in front of the stuff, but to be in front of the stuff, you have to be out there more. So that's where you have to decide, decide why well, and why. where you're going to be. So for me, if I want to enjoy the time with my kids right now, yeah, I, I got to let somebody else take the spotlight sometimes. But I don't mind that at all. As long as we stick to like our code of ethics and the way we work and we keep up the quality, I don't really care who's doing it. The, the whole point is for the quality to be where we want it to be. So if someone were interested in some of the services that you provide, how could they get in touch with you? Uh, we have websites for all of them. So you have the <laughs> adult films with a Z, LLC.com. Terminus is Terminus Production. Well, it's TerminusPR.com. Yep. Um, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever. We answer pretty much any of it. If I don't answer personally, somebody else answer. I mean, and then you can ask your friends. Usually a lot of your friends, if you're, especially if you're from this area, are going to know who we are. Well, Joshua, thank you for coming in. I feel like I learned a whole lot today. I'm really excited to see 
um, a whole other side of an industry that I didn't know anything about. So like I'll pay attention a little bit differently, but I'm excited to see where you go. It's really fun. And if I know some people, I would be happy to refer them to you as well. So well, thank you very much. Thank you and for coming thank you to for the having studio. Us. Of course. And thank you again for listening to Fearless Formula on Business Radio X. And again, this is Sharon Klein reminding you with knowledge and understanding, we can all have our own fearless formula. Have a great day.